an assistant professor in the Department of Pathology and Anatomical Sciences at the University of Missouri School of Medicine. When I came to the University of Missouri, I uh, was lucky enough to get involved with the Thompson Center for Autism and Other Neurodevelopmental Disorders here on campus, um, and was involved with some projects involving um, brain structure. And those projects, because the face and the brain de um, develop and evolve together, um, just developed into this other project that uh, involved the face with autism. If we think that there is something that's affecting the development of the brain, which there seems to be in something like autism, there should be also a reflection in the face if they're developing so tightly together. Um, and so uh, our idea was to look at the face in autism in kids that um, have been diagnosed and compare them to kids who have not been diagnosed with autism and see if we see, see any changes in the face. This uh, idea is actually really an old idea. Um, it's just measuring um, the structure of the body, essentially, and this is something that people have been doing for hundreds of years. And actually, our government and other governments use it in uh, facial recognition software. So when you walk through the airport, wave to the cameras because they're actually applying these kinds of ideas um, directly off those cameras. Um, so we were just applying the idea in a clinical setting as opposed to a basic biology setting. And so what we were able to do was to get uh, camera that takes three-dimensional photographs um, in under two milliseconds so the kids don't even have to sit still um, and then we can use a software that allows us to just um, mark points on the face that again have been used in lots of different ways before um, to compare the overall geometry of the face um, in three dimensions and instead of just looking at you know one specific feature do you know the dis does the distance between the eyes differ between kids with autism as compared to kids without autism um, for example we we could look at the overall geometry, the overall face, and say, is there something in general and overall that is different in these kids? This three-dimensional system allows us to let the kid look anywhere, and they don't have to sit still, and the camera um, takes this image in under two milliseconds, so that's fast, way faster than the blink of an eye. And so we can take a, a number of photographs very, very quickly, um, and if the child even wants to be spinning around at warp speed in the chair, we can still take a bunch of pictures and get one um, where the child has a neutral facial expression. We don't have to worry about their, you know, their eyes being closed, their mouth being open, making a funny face. Um, and so, you know, with kids, this is really important. Um, to be able to not have to worry about them sitting still. What we um, hope to find, but um, weren't sure that we would find, were that there are subgroups of kids, so groups of kids that have very distinct facial features um, as compared to other kids, all um, with a diagnosis of autism. And those groups of kids with these distinct facial features um, correspond with distinct biological features as well as behavioral features. And so we can start to look at how the huge range of variation that we see in the um, presentation of kids with autism, why some kids respond to treatment, why some kids don't, why some kids are able to talk and some kids can't, and so on and so forth, all of the variability in that, maybe we can start looking at the biological basis for that trying to go get to the heart of how um, autism develops and you know, using the face as a window to the development of the brain, a non-invasive way to look at things um, from a biological basis. And so this is just the beginning, we hope.